All right. Welcome everybody to Calming Hyperactive Dogs. This should be a really fun webinar and it's going to be addressing all of these questions like what is normal when it comes to hyperactivity? Is your dog just excited or high energy? Or is this something that we should be looking for red flags around? I'm gonna be going into all these different details with the goal of you understanding at the end, maybe some of the areas and interventions that you can be putting in place to start to see some change with your dog's behavior and welfare and your relationship pills today. And before we do, just a quick um, intro for anyone who doesn't know me. My name is Karishma War. my pronouns are they, them, and I'm Head of Training and Behaviour at Calm Canine Academy. You've probably watched some of our stuff before and you know that we are committed to the science-backed, evidence-backed, ethical way of raising animal uh, and raising animals, especially pet dogs. Uh, and we work with many different certifying organisations to make sure that we are really, really well credentialed. <laughs> um, so I've been working as a dog trainer for almost eight years now, which is wild. And I'm almost at my decade, which is I'm very excited about. <laughs> and over that time, I've worked especially with dogs that struggle with behavior concerns. I've worked especially with dogs in really busy, big cities like New York, Manhattan, London, like really intense spaces. And I've worked with lots of dogs for whom they have a kind of high genetic predisposition to be a little intense because they have um, often like working genetics, meaning that they were bred to do a job, bred to have high energy, basically bred to do certain things. We'll get into these details in a moment. So this was already an area of interest for me before I then raised and I'm in, still in the process of raining, raising two dogs who would fall under the label of, of hyperactive and I say the label of hyperactive because it's important to remember or acknowledge as I didn't for a, a long time that hyperactive is not a character trait <laughs> hyperactive is just a place that they're at right now and we can actually move them away from hyperactivity if we wanted to and I'm quite excited to share the interventions the journey that we've been on with Ash and Hera who are the two dogs that we're going to talk about today um, because they both show this hyperactivity in very different ways and I'm thinking what we'll do today is start off just with an understanding of hyperactivity, get some terms in place, understand what we're dealing with here. Uh, and then we can look into how to kind of heal from hyperactivity, reset a sort of more healthy nervous system baseline, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we'll use my two boys here as case studies. So I think it's going to be quite fun today because you're really going to get a peek behind the curtain at Ash and Hera's lives a little bit and Ash and Hera's challenges. So it should be quite fun. So if anyone who doesn't know, just quickly introducing Hera and Ash, I have to give them some more screen time. Sorry, guys. Hera is my six-year-old poodle now. Wow, six and a half almost. And he's smoldering into the camera there. Uh, he showed hyperactivity in forms like not being able to stop playing, running around a lot, being very fearful, hyperactively sort of vigilant of everything. And Ashes was very big, body slammy, jumpy, mouthy, running, smashing stuff, breaking the TV, you name it. <laughs> uh, so we have like a fear presentation, then we have this like big, bold presentation. Both still had a very similar underlying sort of situation going on so let's start off by learn understanding a little bit more about these behaviors um and how they can manifest so differently and then we'll go into like the healing process and what we might be changing to see behavior change for our dogs so starting off understanding hyperactive behavior so okay what does this look like in real life wild or crazy dogs <laughs> maybe we see common challenges like mouthing tugging on clothes jumping body slamming biting chewing many others let me know in the chat if there are more i want to hear if i'm missing stuff difficulty settling probably is another one i probably i don't have up there that i should for some dogs hyperactivity it can intersect with reactive behaviors or sometimes even aggressive behaviors uh and Often it can lead to guardians and dogs who are feeling very frustrated. Maybe even people can feel embarrassed or like 
I, I felt very like overwhelmed when I first was working with Ash, especially, uh, and, and overloaded. Um, yeah, we've got some barking, we've got fixations, humping. So we'll see a lot of like soothing behaviors often uh, when we see dogs that have hyperactivity. And I'll explain a bit more why that we have that in the moment. So for some dogs, hyperactivity can intersect with anxiety, with reactivity and with aggression. And I'm sure that many people who are watching today, all of your dogs might even have some other behavior concerns outside of the hyperactivity. Maybe they're fearful of dogs, maybe they're overwhelmed by people in the house, maybe they're really nervous about noises. I want you to consider the whole picture here because it's all very related and interrelated. So I don't want you to think that this hyperactivity exists in a vacuum. It's all very interrelated. And it, I'll talk a little bit more about how in a moment. But when we're talking specifically about this issue, <laughs> I have like official terminology <laughs> for you guys uh, from a veterinary behavior textbook, which I think works quite nicely. So officially, hyperactivity is motor activity in excess to that warranted by the animal's age and stimulation level. So starting there, too much movement, too much physical arousal, even when the dog's been worn out and had a big walk, right? That's what that might be translated to. It occurs in a consistent manner. So that's happening over days and weeks and months. You're consistently giving the dog lots of exercise and they're still overstimulated and constantly on the move and struggling to settle and have this arousal I'll talk more about that word in a minute back to our official terminology these dogs often struggle to settle and have some sign of sympathetic arousal even when at rest so sympathetic arousal means the sympathetic nervous system is activated elevated heart rate elevated respiratory rate dilated pupils muscle tension skin starting to a hair starting to stand up because there's muscle tension the physical body is prepared, it's activated. Um, and we often see too much movement, zooming, <laughs> too much excitement um, from these dogs, even when that shouldn't really, you're like, why are you so excited? This doesn't make any sense. Why are you like this? <laughs> and lastly, they say that it, it, it occurs in a consistent manner. It doesn't respond to right, redirection, restraint, um, and they arouse easily. So they get activated easily sleep less, change their focus frequently, and have difficulty giving sustained attention. If this sounds like any of your dogs, I want to know. <laughs> it really sounds like both of my dogs at different times of their life, for sure. And I definitely use these descriptors. Like with Hera, I'd be like, he's just a high energy dog. He's just a poodle. <laughs> he's just a poodle they're like that um or you know he's just really high strong you know like he just he just loves playing he just loves it so much when one of the issues with Hero was that he would bring me these toys over and over and over and over and over again and be unable to sleep and unable to rest because of that so I definitely fell into these descriptors because it's normalized in our environment I think just around us it's normalized for dogs to just like mental health and that sort of stuff it's not the nuances aren't prioritized that much so we can fall into these traps really easily and with Ash I'd just be like he's just intense he's just a bit, bit of a wild child <laughs> and I, I blamed him a lot sometimes you know saying oh he's just so stubborn or he's just like he loves it he he loves he loves that um, I thought he I kind of would feel that sometimes even though I know that's not true intellectually so we can fall into this um when it comes to actually why <laughs> why do some dogs become hyperactive and other dogs don't have you heard actually I'm interested in for folks here what have you heard about this have you heard any like things that you're like I think you've seen or heard on the grapevine heard on the internet and you're like hmm, I wonder if this is true why is it that some dogs become hyperactive I think there are a lot of myths out there like the guardians are bad guardians and the guardians aren't giving them enough exercise and aren't walking them enough breed related says Julia that's definitely one that is actually true <laughs> I'll talk about that in a moment food yeah oh nice nice okay cool 
I'm getting a lot of great, yeah, because they don't get walked enough, Jill. That's the one that I think I'm really circling around. I think this idea that lots of people have in their head is that if we see hyperactive dogs, it's just the guardian's fault or something like that. And that's just absolutely not what it is. Not yet. Yeah, people aren't exercising the dogs enough. And I'm sure you've all been exercising your dogs and giving them so much mental stimulation and trying so hard to meet their needs and still struggling. And that's because behavior is actually much more complex than people who would just blame a guardian and blame someone when they have no idea, just say, yeah, you're just a first time owner. You don't know what you're doing absolute nonsense and let's look at the screen now and see how complex the things that intersect to um, work into dogs becoming hyperactive there are so many intersecting factors here i've had to use our framework which is called the heel framework to break them up into different sections because it's a little bit overwhelming um, as is a lot of behavior, a little bit overwhelming and that's why we use the heel framework at cca which is a framework we've come up with um, and it basically splits up behavior, wellness into these four different areas and then allows us with a step by step process to tackle challenges that often from the first outset look really overwhelming and um, kind of so complicated. So we'll unpick it all together today. And if you want to, we'll send a link to you or it will be below this video to I think you can buy it for like 20 bucks or something. It's not very expensive and you, you, you get all these like trackers and stuff with it, which is quite fun. So you can check that out at a later date. Don't worry if you don't know too much about the heel framework, you don't need to know that much. The first thing you need to know is that we just are splitting up the reasons why into four areas. So why do dogs become interact, uh, become hyperactive? Sometimes it's to do with health factors. Sometimes it's to do with exposure to stress. Sometimes it's got activity schedule at the core. The dog's activity schedule is inappropriate or they have a learning history. They've learned inappropriately that, that, that they should be hyperactive and that's what they need to do to keep them safe, et cetera. Within each of those four areas, I've listed the common challenges that I see people coming up against, the common reasons behind why some dogs struggle with hyperactivity and are bouncing off the walls even after a one hour walk. And some can just lay on the couch, even though they haven't been walked in three days and just got like a little bit of a cuddle, right? Um, the way that we're going to explore this together is we're going to be looking at each one of these factors, health, exposure, activity, and learning one by one. And we're going to look at these, these intricacies and we're going to look at them through the lens of each of my dogs here at Ash so that we can see not just abstractly, we can see it applied to real life a little bit. And you can use this slide as just a, a snapshot and again, I'm going to just say, this is not exhaustive <laughs> at all. <laughs> this is not an exhaustive, this is not, this list does not cover every single thing for every single dog in the world. This is just big patterns that we tend to see. Uh, and so when you have a dog that's struggling with this, you can go down the list one by one. You can listen to Hera's story, Ash's story, and hopefully it will guide you in your next steps. And before I do any detailed um, discussion about behavior change practices, I think it's important to remember and remind everyone that this is never going to be individual advice for your dog. I'm going to be telling you things that I did with Hera and Ash that I would never do with my other dog, Emily, or, you know what I mean? And, and might not be appropriate for your dog. So I want you to kind of, I want what I want people to get from this is the reasons why, the underlying reasons why. And that's why we push this idea of the framework being important. Because if you can understand the framework, then you can extrapolate and you can become really excellent at doing this without anyone's help. I think I'm ready to jump in and just start talking about health and the, how health and hyperactivity intersect and some of the things that we might want to be doing to help in those moments. So let's just get started and look at my beautiful boy. Look at him. Um, I'm going to go through the different bullet points talk a little bit about them, and then I'm going to kind of apply them to Hera so you can see how it's applied in a real case. So we, the first point under the health factors that, that might impact this stuff is breed and genetics. One of you mentioned that in the chat, 100% right. Uh, some people are like, it's all how you raise them, but it's actually not all how you raise them. Epigenetics is uh, the combination of nature and nurture, and that is what truly 
directs behavior. And breeds have evolved out of this human desire to mold temperaments and physical attributes. So some of our dogs were bred for particular jobs like hunting, herding, or protecting. And they, these dogs might have higher energy levels. They might be more hyper-focused towards achieving certain goals. Whereas other dogs were bred to be good companions like toy breeds or even dogs like sight hounds for whom companionship and being a good housemate <laughs> were at the forefront these dogs will likely struggle less with hyperactivity, likely. Remember, not all the time, but likely. So breed and genetics play a really, really big part. And for Hera, I think that was him being a poodle um, in part. Poodles are very sensitive. They're hunting dogs who are dogs that are bred to be more sensitive to fast moving stimulus. They're meant to be very social, uh, but you know, also quite sensitive. And his genetics were unfortunately not fabulous because, <laughs> because he didn't come from the world's most fantastic breeder. Uh, so I'm just going to make sure you can see this. There you go. <laughs> he doesn't come from the most fantastic breeder. So um, I came into this with him when I was doing his treatment for hyperactivity, kind of thinking, you know what, I kind of know that you're going to be struggling a little bit because your genetics have not really set you up for success here. And that's definitely something that's worth keeping in the forefront of your mind. The second thing we have to think about is diet and allergies. So, oh, actually, yeah, maybe I should tell you the things. I'll tell you the things that I did for him um, to do with his breed and genetics. So because I knew that he was going to struggle due to his breed and genetics, I uh, did two things to help him. Uh, I started daily anxiety medication <laughs> because he lives in a city, he's a poodle, and his genetics are not from a long list of temperamentally sound dogs. Uh, so I kind of took a, a guess. Also, there's other things involved, which we'll talk about. Um, but I started him on daily anxiety medication because I figured, you know what, he, from what I know, he's one of the dogs who might need this more than others. I also had some thoughts around his health status. Um, so I started using pain medication when grooming him because he had a lot of anxiety around grooming. Uh, and these were just two ways that I was able to help him because I can't change his breed or his genetics, <laughs> but I can look into ways that I can manage and um, help even the playing field a little bit at this point for him. So breed and genetics do definitely play a part. And obviously we can't impact that, but it, that's not that bad because there are so many other areas that we can impact and, and let's move on to them so diet and allergies now I'm not a nutritionist or a vet but diet makes a huge difference and someone mentioned that in the chat a hundred percent this is something that I was not convinced of for the longest time because I'm stubborn <laughs> I shouldn't use that label on myself but I didn't believe it I didn't want to believe it, but it actually makes an absolutely massive difference, especially if you're seeing any sort of physical issues, itchiness um, or anything like that. Um, if you're seeing any of those things, I definitely consider speaking to a nutritionist or experimenting yourself. I'm invested in folks making informed choices. I am not myself a vet uh, or a nutritionist um, and a nutritionist would be who you'd want to talk to about this over just a, a like kind of vet because nutritionists will have a special interest um, for Hera I just made my choice based off of looking at the ingredients to be perfectly honest I looked at the ingredients and I looked at what was in there I picked stuff that was fresh or not had been not had not been processed very much low carb high protein minimal, minimal ingredients in processing and uh, it's really really worked for him so he's no, now only eating like a very restricted diet that has done massive massive changes to his overall health and well-being so we always look at allergies treating allergies or looking into diet for Hera the allergies could be really reduced with just dietary interventions for others you might need to be going to speak to an allergist etc but you don't always think oh my dog is hyperactive and also really itchy I, I wonder if those are related but they absolutely absolutely are related 
Uh, and for Hira, actually, one of the benefits of switching to this freeze dried diet that is just very like clearly very good for him is weight loss. I also see like really shiny coat and he just looked, you know, when someone's just eating really well and they look really great, I can see that for him. So we looked into helping him in the different areas for health that were contributing to his hyperactivity. We gave him some help with anxiety medication because I knew that he had been like this since he was a week old, which is unusual. It's unusual for dogs to be hyperactive and fearful from a very, 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 very young age. And so we spoke to a, a veterinary um, expert and they said, a veterinarian, and they said, yes, he should definitely be a candidate for that. Um, and we did the diet and allergy stuff, which greatly improved his his health, his health and his behavior, pain and illness. So pain and illness and hyperactivity go hand in hand. We're looking at the coat and the skin health, nails, nails, claws, <laughs> teeth. Uh, we're looking at chronic pain, potentially from arthritis, joint issues, injury, muscle weakness, etc. And it might look like those things are not super important. I spent the first four or five years of Hero's life thinking that, oh, he runs around and plays fetch all day. He is so active. He doesn't ever limp he seems totally fine and actually he seems really fit and healthy but there were subtle signs that I'd missed the way he walked was is not quite right he often pauses before he lays down and stands up he will chase a ball until he is absolutely exhausted but then he'll kind of walk stiffly and slowly afterwards so these indications are just one of many that have behavior professionals and medical professionals thinking, okay, maybe there's something to do with pain going on here. And for Hira, he had these recurrent ear infections because of his allergies, which we've been treating with the diet. And we're now working with ongoing investigations with an expert into musculoskeletal pain. So we, oh, whoopsie, what's going on there? Yeah. Eventually we will be doing things like a pain trial. So testing to see if painkillers help him, x-rays, gait and movement analyses. And when we're talking about health, we're always working with veterinarians, with physiotherapists, with nutritionists, with allergists. What I want to focus on in this webinar is having you prioritize this part of the treatment first. I, lots of people say, you know, do all the training first and then see if, if there's still stuff going on. But often I find that you are kind of not doing your due diligence if you don't check the medical stuff first, because hyperactivity, especially if there are other behavior concerns, is a red flag for these issues with diet, allergies, pain and illness. So I'm really invested <laughs> in having people not make the mistake I did which was wait three four five years almost before really getting my act together with this stuff uh, because honestly if you go to the base to the root think of this as the root of the issue the benefits will be exponential they'll grow out from this root cause at, at the kind of at the core of of um, hyperactive behaviors in general We could always do a little bit more questions and answers at the end about how to do these investigations, how to get the healthcare that you need with your dog for your dog. But I would direct everyone to watch our pain and behavior webinar, which is with a vet, a veterinary surgeon called Dr. Rendon. She's fantastic at the Williamsburg Vet Clinic in New York. So if you check out that webinar, it's an hour and a half. It goes into lots of more detail and there's an actual vet there, which is great because I'm not a veterinarian. I'm just a behavior expert. So we always want to be collaborating interdisciplinary collaboration, especially with hyperactivity because it's so commonly linked to health stuff. <clears throat> All right, let's think about the second part of the heal framework so we look at health that's the first area maybe you're looking down that list and ticking off a few things and you're saying to yourself okay that's what I'm going to do over the next two months I'm going to focus on this health part if that's you don't worry don't get overwhelmed about the next steps you don't have to worry too much about them but it's going to be good to know what's coming um, or you can kind of work these two parts in conjunction but 
exposure and hyperactivity basically just means how much your dog is exposed to stress and stressors on a daily basis. So we're looking at nervous system health. We're looking at how overwhelmed is the nervous system on a day to day basis. And some things that can really impact that are sudden changes, environmental changes. So our dogs thrive with routine, with predictability and changes in their life can massively impact their well-being and their ability to tolerate stress and their behaviors. So some examples, moving home, having new people in the home, new animals, a baby, a loss, et cetera. Um, potentially we're looking at um, even just a big change in our routines, going from working every day to being at home during the pandemic and then back to working every day. These things all add up, right? To hear a the first four years of his life, five years of his life had a lot of change in it. Uh, we moved house a lot of times, especially, and we didn't always live in areas where it was easy to meet his needs. So I promised him, <laughs> I promised him when I started working with him on this kind of for fresh a few years ago, I said to him, I will not leave this house um, for at least five years. <laughs> And I will stay in one place and we will stay in one place. This house meets your needs very well. And I, I gave I gave us that. So sometimes prioritizing, you know, long term stability can also be a huge contributing factor towards healing. So some of our clients, we recommend don't go on vacation so frequently for the next year or so. Maybe you shouldn't be moving home. Maybe you shouldn't be doing that renovation if you can avoid it because the dog needs time to heal. The dog needs time to become more resilient and then we can start to add in load but you know uh it really depends on the dog <laughs> so sudden changes can be really challenging and just generally can like heat up the room kind of increase the overall stress levels another thing is trauma oh sorry chronic stress and overwhelm um chronic stress and overwhelm can happen in so many ways because our world is so stressful and overwhelming. And I'm sure you all identify with that to some degree. <laughs> Whether it's being in the city and your dog is maybe just stressed having to go out to walk to go potty, or maybe they live in a busy house with lots of kids. And so it's just a lot of activity, lots of movement everywhere, a noisy apartment block. So they're bombarded by noises, that dog that won't stop barking in the park across the road that's keeping your dog up. The fact that they're anxious alone and they're left alone every day when you're at work. These are the sorts of things. And when we're looking with our clients, we have a long process of looking into your day to day life and thinking, what causes your dog's stress levels to enter the red? And I think about it like that. I think about it like a little thermometer above our dog's heads and it follows them around like a sim character. And when stressful things happen, the thermometer gets hotter and hotter. And our job is to try and keep the thermometer in the green. Maybe it can sometimes go into the red, sorry, the orange, but we never want it to go into the red. So maybe sometimes it can go into the orange, but we never want it to go into the red. Make sure I'm clear with that. We wanna keep it in the orange and in the green mostly and managing them on a day-to-day -day basis can be really, really challenging. <laughs> um, so for Hera, I stopped walks completely. And a few of you mentioned this in the comments section in the chat. My dog does better when I don't walk them. Because for some dogs, the day-to-day -day life at this point is stressful. It's overwhelming. They can't handle it. So what are we going to do? Are we going to force them to go out there every day because we think that's what's good for them? Or are we going to listen to them when they look stressed on walks, when they're not eating, when they're not playing, zooming after walks? often is a sign of pent up energy. Not always, but sometimes and quite frequently, especially if you're in this webinar, <laughs> likely. <laughs> um, so I stopped all walks with Hera and I tr was trying to do training with him in the home and I was trying to do training on walks and I stopped all of that. And that felt really counterproductive because I'm a very type A, I'm go, let's do this, let's fix it. <laughs> and I had to just do nothing because uh, with hyperactivity, you need to provide space and safety and peace for the nervous system to unwind and heal itself. And I want to go in and control 
the healing process. But actually what I need to do is shield my dog from things that they cannot handle. We have a whole webinar on this. It's called managing reactivity. Even if your dog isn't reactive, go and watch it. It talks about how you can manage reactivity in the home and on walks. And imagine there's this little thermometer above your dog's heads and you're always trying to keep them in the green. So for Hera, this also looked like if there was someone at the door, I had a protocol to keep him calm, which is discussed in full in that We're Managing Reactivity webinar. But to be perfectly honest, often just looks like using food and leashes and gates and these sorts of things to manage the situation so they're not being exposed to uh, challenging scenarios. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit as we go through the webinar about Feisty Fido, because that's our group program for sensitive, hyperactive, reactive dogs. And it's our 10 week program. And it's 10 weeks because it takes a long time <laughs> to get this process kickstarted and in the like full swing. Um, and the first two to three weeks, we're often just troubleshooting how to do this, how to avoid chronic st stress, chronic overexposure to, to stress and, and, and high excitement, overwhelming things. I think about the difference between my life before COVID and after COVID. Before the pandemic, I worked in person in New York City and I would go between houses, five houses a day, working with dogs on the street. And I was just thinking about the amount of input, sensory input to my brain on a day-to-day -day basis. And it must have been in the red every single day. And now I work from home, I have an adjusted my life, I've adjusted everything uh, to suit me, my, my mental health and my animal's mental health better. And, and now it's all down in the green. And it's the difference between how your body feels. If you've ever been in like a chronic overwhelmed state, nervous system dysregulation, you can imagine what we're trying to do. We're trying to create that safety for our dogs. So I stopped walks, I stopped therapy. Um, completely and, and I did you know a few other things as well but just in general I reduced everything down reduced 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 tried to stop putting pressure on him as much as possible and I know he's had trauma and negative experiences I've seen them <laughs> many times and uh, similarly to as you saw in the health category you know I treated that medically with the doctor because I'd worked with him for four years without it. And I spoke to a, one of my colleagues, I spoke to the vet and they were like, stop. Why are you using medication as a last resort for a dog that you know has genetically always been fearful, who's had trauma experiences, been attacked, had you know shut down completely for days at a time. Why are we not treating him with the medical care that any human would get if they were experiencing that? And that really opened my eyes and uh, the daily anxiety medication, I think, was the one of the things that helped unwind that trauma, because after doing a little bit of research, and again, I'm not a vet, so watch our webinar with a vet to learn more, but what it can do is increase the neuroplasticity of the brain. So a trauma, traumatized brain, a fearful brain, it doesn't want to move. It doesn't want to change because that's what's kept, kept it safe this whole time. And what medications do, like what here is on, is helps create flexibility and increase the elasticity and and so that it, we can change behavior with less difficulty with less traction um <clears throat> i also did therapy for him eventually i brought back in therapy for his fear of humans and that was the only thing i did but i waited at least six months without therapy with him but he had multiple years you know he was years and years and years of being chronically stressed so it took him a minute also, it takes about six months to onboard a lot of these medications for anxiety. So that's that's the timeline that we're often looking at. Not all the time. I think here is a pretty um, intense case, but, you know, good to know. And I did start working on his fear of humans. And I'm happy to say that he now has 20 human friends. He lives in a house with two people. They have their friends over all the time. And so we can do it. It's so achievable. Um, but it took a minute. Now he's doing so well with that. There was one more area here that I think is interesting when it comes to hyperactivity, and I see this a lot, inappropriate handling from the humans. So your dogs are being overexposed to almost the overstimulation of rough handling. So dogs that are exposed to rougher or harsher handling can struggle with more mental health and behavior problems and are more susceptible to stress-related problems. That's a, um, I have study, 
it's referenced in the book. I'm going to send you the references um, with the slideshow so you can always go and reference these if you want to. And I, I'm going to recommend a few books that you can read if you want to learn more. Um, but rush, rougher or half, harsher handling has been shown to increase stress. And inversely, many dogs that were uh, massaged, given gentle, consensual touch, showed positive changes in the production of serotonin, beta endorphins, and dopamine, which are all the chemicals we want. <laughs> so we're looking to avoid handling that is rough or harsh or unconsensual. How many times have your dogs been like laying down or like hanging out and you've gone up to them and just like give them a big cuddle and a pet, but they've been chilling and you were just like, I just love you so much. Or when you're bored, maybe you go to them and like grab, touch them or play with them. Or if I'm anxious, sometimes I like fiddle with Hera, like a flipping, like a fidget toy. <laughs> not proud of it. <laughs> It's hard. I was not brought up with these ideas around consent and boundaries. And I'm working every day to get better because I noticed one day that a lot of the times that I was touching Hira, he was not into it. And I imagine that a lot of the times that I was touching him, I was actually spiking the production of the not great hormones, the not great chemicals. And I do think that just fiddling with him throughout the day, I was a really picky, picky mom, you know? My mom was like that, always fussing with him, moving things, touching him all the time, picking him up. I learned from him because that shit did not fly with this poodle. He was like, get the F off me, lady. Um, <laughs> so for Hera, we changed to oops, consent handling at all times. I will not touch you unless you ask me to be touched. I don't even ask him if I can touch him. I just let him come to me more often than not. And I tried to be really unpressured about it. I used to ask him, do you want to cuddle? 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 I'd say it like six times, like, dude, he said no. <laughs> but that, that was just like the way I was brought up. And once I started to realize it, I changed the way that I was doing things. I saw him relax. It was amazing to see. Um, but he does need to be groomed. And so we have a no choice grooming protocol where he gets medication to help with discomfort and anxiety and he gets a, has a muzzle on and it's all done very quickly and then it's over and we we recover and we move on with our lives and that's no choice we don't argue about it if you do struggle with handling we do have a webinar on that as well <laughs> our webinar library is a beast it's, it's only growing so go and check it out um called happy handling so you can learn more about that area but we're looking here at these different areas. Have there been any sudden changes? How can we create routine predictability? How can we make sure that within that routine, we're not being chronically overexposed to stress, to overwhelm, to even to excitement, you know? Like I've been spending a lot of time with a toddler recently. And if that toddler gets too excited, all hell breaks loose. The other day I took them to a soft play and then I took them swimming and oh God, good Lord, no, no they were so overwhelmed <laughs> even though they were good things they were so overwhelmed so we're looking at making sure that they're not overwhelmed in a good way or in a bad way to be perfectly honest sorry in a bad way or in a good way to be perfectly honest because any overwhelm is not good for the nervous system dealing with trauma is an, an underlying trauma that might be there in the body in the nervous system lurking in the back of their brains and thinking about how we interact with them our boundaries with them because how we interact, the respect that we give them, the safety that we give them impacts them in all areas of their life because we are their point of secure attachment. So if we can actually fulfill that, be actually have it be secure and not coercive, it's going to be so instrumental in their success. All right, my love. So we looked at exposure. We've looked at health. So health and exposure. The second two areas are activity and learning. So health, exposure, activity, and learning. I'm going to probably dive in and have a little look. Um, okay, cool. I'm seeing the chat just like checking up and getting like up to date. Some folks are saying it's hard to give them more space. 
I know literally that was my challenge with Hera and I started to tell myself he's not here to meet your needs he's not here to meet your needs and that really helped I was like you don't exist for me you know <laughs> you exist for yourself and I hate it because I don't want to smush you and every now and then I, I do steal a smush I'm not gonna lie but because the bank account is so full now that's okay he, he's okay with that whereas before because he was so stressed all the time because I was just constantly pushing he was not comfy with it lol emily says dying he's got more friends than me i know hera has so many friends all right perfect julia's got a really good question here we don't have orange so you're talking about the that thermometer that i've been, been discussing <laughs> the excitement thermometer the arousal thermometer whatever you want to call it we don't have orange. We go straight to mega red. We go to mega red immediately. And that is often what we see with dogs when we are having hyperactivity. It goes from zero to 100 often is the case. And in those cases, again, I'm really going to be pushing for that health area. Look into the health areas. Do we need to be looking at medications for anxiety to strip manage the anxiety that the dog's experiencing or stress that the dog's experiencing? Is there something else going on underneath this? <coughs> and at the exposure, how can we reduce their exposure to things that they do go from zero to 100 in? So for Hera, that literally meant almost zero walks for a really long time. And like once a week we'd get in my friend's car and they'd drive us and we'd go on like a two hour hike. And then we did lots and lots and lots and lots of exercises and games and stuff and in the in the house. And we were lucky enough to have a yard. So that's what made it work. Um, and we work with lots of clients whom this is a really challenging part of the equation. So we always find a creative workaround and uh, just uh, looking at the details, whatever roadblock we come up against. We've almost always been able to find some way, some some creative solution. All right, let's talk about activity. I'm sure that this is the area that most people go to. You know, your dog's hyperactive. Oh, you don't walk them enough. Your dog's hyperactive. You don't give them enough, enough exercise. As many of you are already seemingly aware of, inappropriate exercise is one of the top things in activity, the activity area, uh, the activity section that we're looking at. However, we're not necessarily looking at not enough exercise. I actually see many guardians, including myself at one, one point, overtaxing their dogs accidentally in an attempt to chill them out. And they wind them up, wind them up, maybe playing fetch like I did with Hera or going on long walks in the city or playing with other dogs at daycares or in dog parks winding them up, 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 and not quite knowing how to bring them down, 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 <laughs> can lead to severe levels of exhaustion for you and the dog, to be perfectly honest, as well as just general the state of overstimulation. But it can look like the dog just wants more and more and more. Hera was this dog. <laughs> uh, Ash was this dog too in an even bigger way than Hera um, I always thought Hera was hyperactive until and, until I met Ash and Ash's need to move was insatiable he would come out of wherever he was sleeping and he would just be pinballing around the room pinballing pinballing all the way everywhere um, just not stopping for a second uh, he would be jumping and mouthing and body slamming everyone and just constantly needing stimulation, constantly unable to settle in a public space. And anytime someone even came into the room from zero to 100. And his response was very physical, you know, hair up, wide eyes, panting, erection, humping and all these sorts of things. I think the big thing is that more exercise is often not the answer. I could have just run Ash for hours and hours and hours and hours a day. Look at this dog. He is fit. He would not have been tired. 
in fact, I would have just made him fitter and fitter. And I think that that's kind of what he had in his early life because he was in a kennel at the breeders for a really long time until he was almost four and a half months. So in that time, he would be in a, in a kennel and then he'd come out and he'd do sports. So he was a dog bred to do sports. So he'd chase flirt poles and do weights and climb up and down things. And it would be very go, 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 go. And then he'd go back to sleep again. So he existed in this state of either on or off, on to a hundred and then off to 100. And there was no in between. So he similarly, um, for him, exercise was not helpful. What we actually needed to think about was exercise that was good for his mind and for his body, because running and jumping and flailing and chasing balls and chasing frisbees like a maniac was not helpful for him. So if you consider like how are our dogs intended to live? maybe short sprints, short levels of high energy exertion, but most of their time would be spent slowly walking, climbing, searching for food, spending a lot of time engaging in social play and maybe a little bit of like, like, um, like crawling and digging and stuff like that. They would not be running and grabbing and maybe they'd be pred predating in some way, but only for very short periods of time, right? Pred predators don't go for hours and time even for 10 minutes at a time that's too long so I thought we were thinking how do we bring Ash and his um exercise back to like a base a more healthy baseline and it took us about six months to reprogram essentially his nervous system because for the first six months it would it would come he'd come he'd wake up and he'd go okay let's go <laughs> we're going 100 let's go 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 until he couldn't go anymore we were trying to teach him actually you don't have to run you can walk you know, you don't have to uh, sprint, you can just amble. And we slowly reduced how much high arousal exercise he had that required low cognition. So like chasing a ball, for example, high arousal, super exciting, low cognition, not that much thought. And we started to increase activities like mindful walking in nature. At the beginning, he just wanted to zoom, 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 zoom. And so we'd have him on a long leash. We encouraged slow walking, sniffing, climbing up the hill, back down the hill, trying to slow him down, re like de re like de-stress him, unwind him, and bring him back into his body. What can you see? What can you smell? How does it feel being inside your body? Thinking about reducing the kind of exercise he wanted and increasing the amount of exercise he needed was key. And at the beginning, it was really hard to convince us all that this was what he needed because we were like, no, he'll never rest. He'll chew up the crate, he'll chew up the house. But actually what we started to see was a dog who, because their day-to-day -day activity schedule included all of these activities that were regulating them instead of pumping them up, we then saw him starting to pick up those skills in real life in day-to-day -day life, in moments of life, outside of the activities and training. So it was very cool. And of course, we did give him access to high arousal, like big, wild, crazy, <laughs> like he got to be his big, wild, crazy pig. Don't worry. He got to play with his friend once a week. He had a play day, you know, he got time tugging with a, a special tuggy toy that was really fun for him. Uh, and he, you know, he'd do lots of fun things that, and run, running, you got lots of opportunities to do all of that, but that wasn't the only thing he did. And we actively encouraged him to do slow, mindful walking in nature, etc. We also had to think about mental stimulation because if it were up to Ash, he would not use his brain at all. He would use his big sexy body, those big muscles, and he'd just smash his way through every problem that he encountered. And we actually had to teach him how to do low arousal high cognition work how to do things that don't get the body up 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 but just let he can just think without getting pumped up that was so hard for him and because he was such a hyperactive dog at the time he struggled to learn so he would not have been very good with most people trying to train him because he got so pissed off he wanted the food so bad and he could not handle it uh, and I see, I could really see at the beginning when we were working with him, that when we were training with him, he was getting pissed off and it was contributing to his stress. So we had to give him mental stimulation and we did it through daily free work, pattern games and scent work. We did it this way because 
these are the ways that are going to be the uh, less, least stressful for him. Uh, we'll look at some videos of these in a minute. I'll just give you the overview. Free work is basically a scavenging game that you can play with your dogs. And I'll, I'll show you some videos in a minute. Um, it, but it essentially involves a lot of that slow movement, problem solving, um, using fine motor skills like paws and mouth and teeth, rather than just smashing into it with your body. Um, and it's an independent activity, so he can do it by himself, which I think is a great way to teach dogs to settle, to not constantly bother their guardians, which is something he did a lot, constantly bothering us. The training we did with him had to be really easy and we picked Pattern Games by Leslie McDivitt. If anyone's seen Pattern Games, they are very loopy, repetitive training games that are very simple and allow the dog to be very successful. Uh, and we also did some scent work with him because sniffing is a really calming activity, uh, but also extremely mentally stimulating. So sniffing being both mentally stimulating and calming, it's a double whammy. We're gonna be tiring him out by getting him to sniff stuff out from around the house. And we're also gonna be regulating his nervous system and building that skill at the same time. So we worked with these three things and I'll show you some videos in a moment. And we created a pattern on uh, a schedule that worked in thinking as well about rest. Did you know that our dogs are meant to get 17, 16 hours of sleep a day. Most stable dogs are found to rest and sleep for 17 or more hours a day. This is um, from the book Stress in Dogs. The authors uh, found that many dogs are actually living in, in with er erratic sleep cycles in states of exhaustion. And when we watch free living dogs, they often have an extremely rhythmic routine day the same thing happens every time and when our dogs are coming with us to work and then getting on the subway and then blah, they're not having that they're not having the same thing that predictability and they're not sleeping that 17 hours a day that they need so we often have to really significantly model our day around them getting sleep like you would a toddler <laughs> so for ash he would have a very strict schedule and intermittently throughout the day, he gets to rest, he gets to sleep. And uh, he gets to um, often in a crate or in a bedroom, like maybe we'll take him to a bedroom and I'll work on my bed while he'll sleep on the bed for two hours. But it's very, it's mindful. I'm not gonna be going, getting up and going down and going to use the bathroom and calling people and waking him up. I want him to sleep. And if I'm gonna be active and the household is gonna be active, that's when he goes away into his crate. And it's very, very strict like that because otherwise he will not sleep all day because every time someone comes into a room, he's like, it's the best day of my life. And that's just really not helpful for him or his mental health. <laughs> so definitely something to be thinking about um, there. And the last thing we did is we used the activity triangle to meet his needs and to, to structure his day. So let me show you some uh, of these resources, some of the like, videos and pictures of what we're talking about here. So I'm going to show you, first of all, the activity triangle. So give me a second. OK, this is the activity triangle. It's just a concept that we use at CCA that helps us structure our day with our dogs without it being overly restrictive, because I find it really hard to stick to a very strict schedule. I need concepts, I need frameworks that can move around me so that I don't have to be so rigid. And I found this to be really helpful. So think about it like this. For any waking period of your dog's, uh, dog's life, <laughs> whenever your dog's awake, you wanna be moving them through this activity. Part. Well, actually it's not even when they're awake. Scratch that, I'm gonna start again. So this activity triangle is a way to build and manage the different activities in your dog's day. You start off with high arousal. High arousal activities are the ones that get their sympathetic nervous system activated. They are panting, they are excited, they, their muscles are activated, you know, they have all these things, respiratory increase, etc. Your games, your, your, your playing with tug, your walk around the neighborhood, even your decompression walk, I think to some degree is high arousal, even if you're in a, um, in even if you're like calm, you're still very active, your brain is very active. Um, so you're, you're gonna do this kind of more 
intense activity, then you can shift to low arousal, which will be something calming, chewing, licking, maybe something to do with like foraging, uh, or it could be cuddling, <laughs> massage, um, or, or sniffing the air in the garden while you lay down, but you're moving from this high activation, nervous system activated blood pumping, then you wind them down. And I want you to think about what are the activities that wind your dogs down? Um, what works for them? Is it being in a quite dark, quiet, dark room and chewing while you watch Netflix? Is it being in the garden and sniffing for treats and then flopping down in the sun? Uh, is it, you know, free work or a foraging activity, a, pro a food problem, etc. cetera? Um, an example of high arousal would be this. This is Ash and I in our local park. And we're playing a really fun game, really simple game. Hopefully you can all see this video. Let me know if you can't. But he's on a long leash. So just be aware because he's still young. He's not quote unquote you know, fluent. And we're playing a simple pattern game called the whiplash turn, where I throw a cookie in one direction and then in, in another. I'm marking yes whenever he turns back towards me. So every time he turns towards me, I'm marking yes and I'm feeding him. And I'm, I'm mostly I'm throwing the food in these big curving arcs or I'm sometimes I do feed him from my hand. These pattern games are the games that we use to build communication, to build collaboration, engagement, out in distracting environments and if you take feisty fido if you join us in one of our programs we'll teach you all these steps you learn like four or five different ones of these games and we slowly bring them out into these environments at the beginning ash could not do this in this environment he'd be too overwhelmed um but bearing in mind when you're watching us do this game i'm not telling him what to do i'm not commanding him this kind of training and learning is collaborative and that's why it's going to help with hyperactivity because it's not going to be jutting up against their nervous system being all frustrated. Um, they're going to actually feel good. This is going to be fulfilling. They're going to feel heard. They're going to feel like it's a conversation and not just um, you telling them what to do and over and over again. And it can be so, so helpful for these dogs who are often a little bit like demand avoidant almost. Um, so it's pattern games, training that looks like this, where the dog is happy and excited and enthusiastic and not pissed off is really, really important. <clears throat> so that's an example of high arousal. And let me show you an example of low arousal. I mentioned that free work um, in on the other slide. This is one of the mental mental simulation games that we do for Ash. And this is just one example. It, it's a silly setup. I love making these videos. They're so satisfying. Um, I basically just keep all of this stuff and I set up foraging ac activities for him as if he was a street dog who was just coming across a pile of junk with a bunch of different projects. He can lick, he can chew, he can shred, he climbs, he moves slowly and mindfully in a small space over different surfaces, different levels. He has water freely available. I want to do just a full free work workshop because I'm obsessed with free work for hyperactive dogs. This is Hero, but we do it with Ash. Almost every time he comes out of the crate, if he's, if he's overexcited, we also do it with him to cool him down. So this can be part of that low arousal activity uh, section of the activity triangle. So we've looked at activity. We're on to the last one almost here. Um, we've got health, we've got exposure to stress, we've got activity schedules. And finally, Ash is gonna show us how learning impacts hyperactivity. So let me just flick through real quick. Give me a moment. Learning. In the HEAL framework, the learning category is all about the dog's experiences, knowledge, and the human's experiences and knowledge. Um, one of the first things I'm thinking about with learning with our dogs that are struggling with hyperactivity is early socialization factors. So if you've been around 
doggy, nerdy, <laughs> the internet for very long, you'll probably know that socialization is something that technically happens in the first three, four months of a puppy's life, really right at the beginning. And that's when their brains are the most malleable and open and receptive to learning and becoming okay and comfortable with things. If our dogs are not exposed to a wide variety of people, dogs, environments, and experiences in this critical socialization period, it's quite likely that they'll develop fears, anxieties, and nervous system dysregulation. So often we have dogs that are really scared of people in hats with sticks, children. And often folks say to me, I bet they had a, a traumatic experience with that, with a person with a stick. More likely is just that the dog never saw a person with a stick. That is the most likely thing. Um, uh, and even if they just don't experience them, that's enough for them to then become quite sensitive to them in the future. So I think this is a super important factor at play. There's nothing that I can do <laughs> about the fact that Ash was in the at the breeders um, in those periods and didn't manage to get to the home in time, which was not the breeders fault. It was because of COVID and restrictions around movement that we couldn't get him in the home until four and a half months. But when I, that's when they started, when I got him at four and a half months and for the first, still even to this day to be honest but really for the first year year of his life with us we were working on remedial socialization so we're trying to do it backwards we're trying to reverse engineer socialization <laughs> technically it wasn't socialization it was exposure work it was therapy that we did to him to, with him to slowly expose him to the world so that the world was less overwhelming so we were trying to teach him that the world was safe and for the first few months of his life he didn't go on many walks either. We did a lot of work every day, multiple sessions a day. Um, so working on like undoing some of that and getting that learning in place uh, retroactively was helpful. Um, poor training methods and equipment is often something we see impacting hyperactivity. So harsh training methods, quick fix methods, equipment that promises to cure your dog from pulling and lunging or barking. These things often use discomfort in order to suppress the dog's unwanted behaviors. Real behavior change takes time, but quick fix training can look flashy because the dog quite quickly stops the behavior, but underneath the surface, the dysregulation is actually usually worse. It's like a ticking time bomb of stress. And so sometimes, you know, your dog might be on a prong collar on their walk and they get really excited when they see the prong collar because they want to go for their walk. But when they come back, they're really hyper panting, eyes are pulled back in a big wide smile, you know, and, and they can't settle down in that for ages. Maybe that was causing extra stress. I mean, that makes sense, right? Um, so use of punishment, coercion, anything like that can increase stress and conflict. And the dogs will generalize that very quickly. So very quickly that will light up like fire that that stress will become associated with lots of other things fear generalizes quickly it's a biological imperative it makes sense for survival not helpful if you are told by a trainer that you should put your dog on a head halter and then correct them when they look at other dogs and growl your dog learns that other dogs mean pain generalizes that to every other dog now they're really afraid of other dogs that's not your fault but it can happen and it can impact this he had never had any super harsh treatment at all but we did try to make his life as comfortable as possible with a back clip harness a martingale collar and longer leashes when we were walking him because for him movement was a way that he dissipated stress so giving him a longer leash was really helpful when we could to be able to have freedom of movement uh, when training and when walking, even in like the sub quiet suburban areas where it's safe to do so. Lack of communication skills. I think this can mean a lot of different things and I'm not just looking at the dogs here. I'm looking at the humans too. Sometimes we see humans that are struggling to read dog body language. They think their dogs are excited, but they're actually stressed. That was me. I thought Ash was really excited when I was playing with him and he was jumping and doing backflips. Actually, he was frustrated, stressed, overwhelmed, overstimulated. He kept doing it because he's designed to and because 
we are the best thing ever you know like he's designed to want to do that with me but it wasn't what was good for him so I had to get really good at reading dog body language reading the difference between a nice soft excited face and a stressed face they're different we also see some human beings misunderstanding dog behavior so thinking that the dogs are trying to be dominant maybe or, you know, the dog's just stubborn, or they're just, you know, being an, an asshole, <laughs> which I've definitely fallen prey to that last one occasionally. Um, remembering that they're doing this because they have no other choice. Whatever they're doing, whether it's body slamming you, peeing on your stuff, ripping up your couch, they're doing it because they have no other, other way of coping in that moment with the feelings that they're feeling. And many of these hyperactive dogs are kind of overwhelmed a lot of the time and really need help. So we need to start to learn how to speak dog body language, how to, sorry, how to read dog body language, but also how to speak dog body language. Like how does your communication come off to the dog? Because I used to come into the room and go, Ash! and guess what? That was a bit overwhelming for him. He wasn't necessarily scared. He was just too stimulated and it was uncomfortable, I think. That's how I read it anyway. And so I want you to think about your skills first, the human skills reading dog body language, how your behavior impacts your dogs, how you can be calmer, how you can help them be calmer with your body language, et cetera. But then also the sort of um, building communication with the dog um, using these kind of errorless frameworks, this loopy patterned games that we do. The goal is that the dog never makes mistakes. We're never saying, no, that was wrong. It's just about collaboration. You're never wrong in a conversation. You know, so we try to use these conversational training games rather than commander and commanded training games to build communication, um, as well as, uh, you know, obviously making sure that the human side of things is, is up to scratch. Uh, I, I tended I, I do have a pretty good understanding of that stuff, but I did have to introduce more errorless learning stuff for Ash when he started to get frustrated when training, barking, rolling around, jumping, trying to snatch the treats. Um, and it took a lot of time for me to figure out how to teach him without him getting overwhelmed. And that's something that what we do in Feisty Fido and in our programs is that people send us videos of them doing the homework and we literally coach you through our online program. Like we have like a kind of um, online learning hub and you can send videos we then send you back feedback and we also do live training in the class where you can get immediate feedback in like verbally from your trainer that's often what we need to do we need to be able to to give you immediate feedback in in how to do these training sessions with your dogs so for ash we had to build all these things like he had to be full he had to have eaten a full meal we had to use frozen peas because he was so food motivated. We could only do training with him after he'd been on a big decompression walk because that was when the only time that he could use his brain. So we need to think about those, those skills. And then we need to think about down regulation skills. So down regulation skills mean things that bring that thermometer from the red to the orange to the green. Often our dogs and often us, we've practiced going up. We've practiced raising the thermometer up through the orange and into the red. We've practiced it so well, we're bloody fluent in it. We can raise that thermometer to the red like this. Give us two seconds, we'll be hot, right? Your dog is the same, right? So we often have to start to strengthen the other side of that equation, which is the down regulating. And for humans, that can look like, you know, um, meeting your needs. And for me, I really needed to make sure that I was going to the gym. I was eating well. I was taking time to go out and meet, be with my friends. And I had, I had to get people to come and help me and babysit and stuff because I needed help. But sometimes you need the down regulation skills just as much as your dogs do. So if that is you, think about meeting your needs. Think about do you have any breathing exercises that work, any games that you can use to help center yourself when your dogs are being a bit overwhelming? For me, I often do like a thing where I talk to him I, and I, I've posted about it before where I'll be like, oh my goodness, are you running around? Oh, you're peeing. Okay, well, that's what happens. I guess you're just a stinky little pig. It helps me to like do that. So that's one of the things that works for me as well as like breathing work. Um, and then we developed a down regulation toolkit um, for Ash. And at its simplest, searching and sniffing for food. 
because he would get so aroused that he wouldn't sniff. <laughs> He'd be breathing fast through his mouth and he wouldn't search and sniff for food. We had to teach that. <laughs> starting with frozen peas in the house because he'd get so excited he'd just be jumping and jumping and trying to get it from our hands so searching and sniffing for food I did this with Hira as well and Hira used to only be able to search for about one or two seconds before he gives up now Hira will sniff for food for 60 seconds two minutes at a time he'll just diligently search so through doing these skills we're building their ability to self-regulate to take to kind of be resilient, to persist, all of these things. It's, it's so it's so interdisciplinary, it's so interconnected. But searching and sniffing for food, a default stand and wait. Do any of your dogs like offer you a bazillion different behaviors when they just need to just stop <laughs> for a second? I taught him a default stand and wait um, uh, so that when I was reaching into my treat pouch, holding food, taking a breath, looking around. He wasn't going mental in front of me. Um, just waiting for food <laughs> was the first thing we taught. And we worked with some arousal games. And arousal games basically just mean building up, building up the arousal, raising that thermometer and then draining it. So practicing the upregulation and the downregulation within a system again these are all things that we can teach you i can't necessarily teach them all to you through zoom in an hour without seeing you or giving you any individual feedback so what i thought might be more helpful was just be to kind of show you some of them oh, the last thing we did with ash was mindful observation and body work so we he liked being touched and pet so we taught him to sit on a mat and while we give him massages and then we started to introduce him watching things that get him excited from that mat while getting massages and he has to stay on the mat uh, or he has to with the goal is that he chooses to stay on the mat so that that's something that we've done with him as well um let's have a look at what some of this might look like in the learning category because it's got some slightly more fun videos associated with it i think <laughs> this is one of our trainers nico nico works in manhattan and uh she is showing us in this video work with a dog called Rue and Rue, some information about Rue, had to stay in the house at this time because they lived in Manhattan and she hadn't onboarded her anxiety medications yet and she was too scared outside. Um, but what you're going to see in this video is one of the ways that we can get their needs met inside while also working on controlling their arousal. Um, so we're getting the dog a little bit excited and in this case we're using a rabbit skin tug toy so the goal is to get the dog a little bit more aroused to raise up that thermometer and uh tugging and playing for this dog used to be something that would get them too excited and they'd, they'd start zooming around so what we're working to work on and what you'll see nico do is a little bit of higher higher arousal start to raise that excitement and then we're going to switch to a lower arousal and usually we involve food in the equation trading for that toy nice and safely if you have resource guarders do not try this at home please speak to a trainer and then we actually have her mat her settle mat next to her which is one of the down regulation skills that we teach so we can teach a default stand or a default settle and this is a default st settle and we're working on even after she was excited her bringing herself back down, seeing that mat, seeking it out, being able to just lay there and breathe through her nose. And then Nico goes on to add a little bit more level of difficulty by taking some steps away from her. And this kind of settle, default settle, is something we teach in depth. We have four or five different steps that we do to get to this level. So please don't just try this at home without any um you know work beforehand but this idea that we can kind of raise them up and bring them down raise them up and bring them down and build fluency together in getting up and getting excited and then calming down and here we have nico being like come on come and play again for some dogs it can take a little bit of like you can look at her she's so cute it can take a little bit of like teasing <laughs> um so this is what just a little snippet of what arousal games could look like. Again, not everyone's looks like this. There are many different versions of this game. The, the general idea is raising the thermometer, draining the thermometer, practicing putting up regulating and down regulating on cue. So that's a, an example of arousal control and settle work. I think I have one more. 
Oh yeah, another one of the um, toolkit uh, things that we can offer for down regulation is an off switch. So an off switch or a terminator cue. Um, so in this video here, you'll see me playing with Hera. The beginning bit of the video is all arousal control work. The goal for me and Hera, it was to be able to think even when doing really exciting things. So I don't want to never let my dogs get hyped up. I want them to get hyped up, but I want them to be able to be thinking and regulating even when they're excited. So here is practicing tricks with a very arousing reinforcer for him. The Frisbee is the most exciting thing. So he's learning to be able to control himself around this exciting stimulus. Uh, and you're seeing you know, him doing a variety of different behaviors like bringing the toy directly to my hand, doing a go around, uh, and he's doing spins and stuff like that as well. Uh, all of this involves high level cognition. He's in, this is smarty stuff and he's doing it while his body is in a really activated state. So this is advanced. That bark was on cue, by the way, that wasn't frustration. Like our other dog comes to get involved. What I want you to see is the terminator cue. So I'm gonna turn the sound on. Go around. Yes. Good job. Nice job, kid. Yes. Oh, yes. I'm going to do it. Good. All right, hold on. Good job. Hold on. So I say all done to him. I uh, give him this signal. <clears throat> That's our terminator cue. It means this is over. And what you saw him do was turn away and move away from me. And what he did a moment later was put the toy down, take a deep breath, panted a little bit, lay down and settled. So we teach our dogs how to turn it off. The steps of this are outside of the scope of today's webinar. We can't do it all <laughs> today. I wanted to give you an overview because no one skill is going to be helpful for you and your dogs. What you really need is a full like high level, whoops, conception of how your dog's heal framework characteristics impact their hyperactivity. And you might be looking down this list and going, gosh, I have a lot of things that I have to work on. That's totally fine. The point of breaking it up like this is so that we have lots of little achievable goals, you know? So start with health and exposure. How can you make sure that your dog is not needing to check if your dog needs anxiety medications to help them manage their stress? Or do we need to check for allergies, try a different diet, look into pain or possible illness? Then we look at exposure to stress, dealing with trauma, creating stability. On top of that, we build activity schedules that need to be consistent you can use the activity triangle. You're thinking about lots of mental stimulation and appropriate exercise with rest. And then finally, we build learning on top. So the communication skills, the down regulation skills, these are the last things that we're going to be doing with our dogs. And I think many people jump to that training way too quickly. Again, we do a lot of training in Feisty Fido. We spend the first two weeks really focusing on the first three bullet points. And then we spend the rest of that time learning engagement skills, down regulating skills, practicing our arousal moderation, taking our skills out into the real world, getting hands on feedback about your training from our experts who are specialists in working with this particular behavior concern. Um, and my goal today was not that you can look at my work with Hira and Ash and then create your own training plan that is the same or practice the same things we were doing. My goal is that you can see how this all intersects and impacts upon each other and how you can see that maybe we have to be thinking more fundamentally, foundationally first and then building these skills, these learning skills on top. So I'll just finish up by saying to folks, if you're looking through our webinar, if you're thinking, wow, this sounds really useful, if your dog maybe also has sound sensitivity issues in the urban environment or busy environments with people, with dogs, with prey, with kids, Feisty Fido is our foundational program 
for sensitive dogs and it is truly transformational I've been doing it now for three years um it's transformed it's come through all of these iterations every time I learn something new I bring it into the program and uh it's pretty innovative and accessible in my, if I don't mind saying so myself, because it's 10 weeks of learning. So you get pre-recorded content, you get weekly Zoom classes, you get live training coaching. So in your sessions, you'll be going through one by one, having time with your trainer. What are your goals this week? Doing live training. And then in between sessions, you get to send in questions, homework videos, et cetera, for review by your trainer who has a certain amount of time every day to check in with you. So it's a really about transforming and healing and empowering you, the guardian, with the skills to be able to help your sensitive, rambunctious, feisty Fido. We have amazing, amazing trainers and we consistently get fantastic um, reviews from our Feisty Fido program. If anyone is interested in this, we will send you links to purchase. You can do payment plans, et cetera. We really want it to be accessible, but also have it work and be effective. Um, so I'll be sending out an email tomorrow, or if you're watching the recording below, there will be information uh, about the slide deck, links, other resources you might want to look at, as well as how to join Feisty Fido um, or speak to one of our staff members.